Eh, Mijay Petrovsky es una verdadera institución, tanto dentro del mundo de los museos, tanto por la entidad de la institución que dirige el Museo de la Hermitage en San Petersburgo, uno de los grandes museos mundiales, pero también por su brillantísima carrera eh, profesional. Él es doctor en estudios árabes. Eh, desde 1991 fue nombrado eh, director adjunto del Hermitage y desde 1992 eh, es su director, es el, el decano de todos los los, los directores de museos que estamos eh, aquí. Eh, ha compaginado siempre esta tarea como director con su docencia en la universidad. Es el director del Departamento de Estudios Orientales y de Museología en la Universidad Estatal de San Petersburgo. Y sería absolutamente eh, imposible enumerar todas las distinciones y galardones que ha recibido a lo largo de, insisto, esta brillantísima eh, carrera profesional, caballero del mérito de la República Italiana, la Legión de Honor eh, Francesa, es miembro de las principales academias rusas y es para nosotros un verdadero honor que esté con nosotros hoy aquí. Por favor. Thank you very much and well good morning it's a very good morning because I began the morning with the visiting Frangelico exhibition and the first thing I have seen was the picture from Hermitage so it's a great symbol of our wonderful relations. Uh, there are a lot of symbols of our relations, uh, and we also celebrated our anniversary, so I want to give our colleague Palamir a medal of Hermitage celebration. Uh, I had the pleasure to be here, not exactly here, but in Prado, 25 years ago, when we had the same meeting of museum directors, that time everybody was coming, every week there was one director. Now we are all together, it's, it's grateful because it's another good meeting. And <coughs> we have been discussing the different projects of the museums, and I should say that, well, we realized all these projects. The, project, the Prada project is realized. We are now sitting in the place which was built after that meeting. Hermitage, we had the <coughs> project called Great Hermitage, and it is also realized. And just to remind you about. Oh, sorry. Not Hermitage, this is Winter Palace. This is Small Hermitage, Old Hermitage, New Hermitage, Hermitage Theatre, the reserve building. And here is the addition, addition that what was called the General Staff Building, which is uh, restored. Well, all this part of the, this belongs to Hermitage, and also this column was taken as a part of Hermitage during these 25 years. And here we have the display of art of the 90s, 20s, and 21st centuries. It's addition of something like 250 new uh, rooms and the space, here you go across the street, we go across the square. Uh, Hermitage is a museum of different ways of presentation. Ah, this is the new Hermitage and the way of presentation in a palace which is built, a palace museum, built by Leo von Klenze. Uh, and this is our new building, the Matisse room, in the <coughs> general staff building, another way of showing art. And this is things we're very proud of, and also in 2025 years, it's our open reserves, three buildings, where you have the storage open for the public, step by step. This is an example of our storage of costumes. We change every five months, and it's a big collection. We have the same kind of storages for carriages, for applied arts, for paintings, and. So on. this is a part which we, uh, I think is a good recipe. Everything must be accessible, but you can't make accessible in the same way. Art must be accessible in different ways. So open storage is one of it. Also our project, which is called Great Hermitage, part of it is having the satellites of a museum. Uh, satellites which uh, uh, we call them, uh, satellites, we call them Sputniks, in Russian word. Because the system here, you see the Hermitage Amsterdam, uh, 15 years 
it does exist. Every six months we make an exhibition. It's our additional uh, exhibition space, which is very important. We have experiments because, you know, Dutch taste is different, Dutch design is different. So some things we make first in Holland and then in Armitage, sometimes first in Armitage, then in Holland. And we call them satellites because uh, this system, it can be changed. You have, you can have, you can't have uh, satellites forever. You just move them, you have seven years, seven years, 20 years, 15 years. When the need is finished, it can, the satellite can change the, or change the orbit or change the content and so on. So we are doing it permanently. Some of them are non-existent now, like Hermitage London. Now we are trying to build Hermitage Barcelona. We're having Hermitage Omsk, Hermitage Sibir, Hermitage Ural. We have Hermitage Italy. Tomorrow we're signing new agreement, the third agreement for having Hermitage Center, research center in Italy, and uh, so on. Uh, but I want to speak uh, today a little bit more about the mission of the museums. We all know that our museums, we are created to collect, to keep, to restore, to study, and to show to the public uh, cultural heritage and uh, artistic heritage of our nations. We have to educate our nations. We have to educate in the sense of good taste in art. We have to educate their historical dignity. It's not exactly patriotism. It's historical dignity, right feeling to your own history, whatever it is. Museums of today uh, became extremely important in the social life, much more important than before. People do listen to the museum. People do come to the museum. Museums are very open. Museums are a little bit like internet, open to the public. Everybody can have uh, opinions, uh, meanings, and we try to educate people through the uh, museums. Museums are very democratic, the most democratic institution in the world because it's for everybody. If every museum has something for everybody who comes for the child or to the old person, to the person who doesn't know much about art but still has some, can find something, to the gourmets and great specialists. So uh, that's why what we do is not only important, it's extremely important, and we can try to solve some of the problems of today. We can solve them, we can propose certain recipes. One of the problems of today, that the world of today is a world of hate, it's of enmity, of irritation, and part of it is connected with history and understanding of cultural heritage. We have all over the world what we call the wars of memory, where people are fighting each other, or the conflicts are based on memories, historical memories, artistical memories, who is responsible for what, who is better, who is older, and so on, and so on, and so on. All over the world we have this kind of discussions. Sometimes these discussions bring uh, people to the real wars, like we see it in Balkans, like we see it in Caucasus, like I'm afraid we are going to see all over the world. And we can do something. All these uh, wars of memory, uh, they uh, can be, could be developed also by the museums and historians. We can just bring some oil into the fire of uh, these conflicts, or we can try to make them a little bit lower, a little bit lower by putting these uh, differences into the realm of discussion, into the realm of cultural di uh, dialogue. Well, just with one point, which is important, uh, uh, let's talk about differences and understand that differences are beautiful. It's so good that you have different styles in art. It's so good you have different heritages. It's also good when you have different religions in the world. It's also good when you have different opinions. Let's hear them all. It doesn't work always, but sometimes it does work. And I want to give you some uh, uh, examples of how we are trying to address different kinds of uh, problems connected with the historical uh, memory. Uh, Welcome memory, which we present to the visitors of Hermitage and to Hermitage exhibitions and centers abroad. We do have four million, four and a half million visitors every year. One million and a half to our exhibitions abroad. 
uh, so it's a big audience. I think we're now in the limits of uh, our possibility to accept the number of the people. Uh, and to them we present also some historical exhibitions of different kinds. The, uh, differences and wars of memory or conflict of memories could be vertical, one time against another, or horizontal. Or horizontal are very well known. You can't write. You have to be very careful with writing the geography of what you have for where the objects come. Tibet or China, Georgia, Armenia. By the way, uh, I have seen <coughs> yesterday marks some on some exhibitions which call Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan in Hermitage it won't pass because you have to be very careful about these borders in Central Asia and the countries which never existed 100,000 years ago. But it's not, but it is the easiest thing. Well, our subject, Russian Revolution. What you have here, this uh, uh, Nikolaevsky Hall on the Winter Palace, which uh, during the revolution was a hospital, and we have a big photo of the hospital which was in the same hall. It's part of our exhibition on Russian Revolution. Certainly, Russian Revolution is for us the most controversial thing, different opinions, uh, difficult, different hysterical opinions, good, bad, crime, blessing. Uh, we are the place where this revolution really happened, because our walls do remember the history, and we uh, try to make walls speak to speak and to say to remind. One of the most important, well, symbolical things during the Russian Revolution was the storming of the Winter Palace, which was uh, never a real storming because, well, the most of the palace was uh, hospital. Uh, small groups of revolutionaries tried to find uh, provisional government and it was difficult to find them in all these rooms of Hermitage. And we showed them with the story of the hospital. We also showed another story that uh, it was important to have a storming of the Winter Palace because all the Russian Revolution was based on the uh, history of French Revolution. And there was a storming of Tuileries, a real storming. So there should be a storming. So they made a storming, just made we stormed the Winter Palace. And then our great uh, filmmaker, Eisenstein, made a film October, which made it really into a big storm and fight and revolution, which never happened. But, well, it's how art changes understanding of history to the uh, degree that when Jean Renoir was doing his film Marseillaise about the real stomach of the theory, he was looking on the, well, example of Eisenstein, and he made it like, to look like an Eisenstein stomach of the Winter Palace. <coughs> so that's how we... Uh, try, and we made an exhibition about Eisenstein also. That's how we try to put it also in a context, uh, historical context, in the context of different opinions, in the context of a reality, so to make it historical event, modern event, which makes people confrontated also for Russia. Today it's a very emotional story. Another emotional story is the church. This is the church of the Winter Palace. Uh, churches certainly when in the Soviet period most of the churches have been closed, made museums or whatever. Now churches are given back, there are services in the churches, but there is also a little bit of the exaggeration. This is the church of the Winter Palace, it was the home church of Romanov family, so it will be wrong, wrong to have it open and have the services all the day and with all the rituals of uh, baptism and so on in this kind of a church. So we keep it for services, memorial services in the morning and we made it a place to remember the Romanov family. You can see there the portrait of Nicholas II just recently given to Hermitage. You can see here the shirt of Nicholas which was on him when he was attacked during the official visit to Japan. You can see here the robe, official officer's robe of Alexander II, which was on him when he was killed by the bomb. So we try to put it also in another context of history. And then we have another story, the war and siege of Leningrad. It's another controversial uh, story because, uh, well, there's a discussion. What was it? Because it was, siege was using hunger, the weapon 
in the military uh, affairs. Uh, what was it? Fighting like Stalingrad, or was it things like Holocaust, or like Dresden, or Hiroshima? Well, it's a crime, or it was a great fighting. There are different opinions. There is another talk about maybe it was better to just uh, to give the city to the German and to save many lives. It's, this discussion also goes on. It's a very touchy discussion. What does the museum think? We tell the story of Hermitage. We tell the story of Hermitage, and there is, you see the picture of Rembrandt room during the war when the pictures have been evacuated, the frames stained on the place. And uh, during the war, Hermitage curators made, I think it was twice or three times, excursion for the soldiers through these rooms, just telling them about the pictures, which was not in the frames, but which will come in the frames when you will bring the victory to us, something like this. And this story <coughs> became a very popular one. There are books written on this. There's a book, English book called Madonnas of Leningrad. And we use also the contemporary art to remember, to remind this story of fighting culture against evil. Uh, we have uh, Japanese artist Morimura made, using this story, he made uh, pictures of Hermitage. By the Photoshop, he took out the pictures themselves, the frames, and the model, modern visitors. So there, how we keep uh, people reminding, uh, remembering about what is essence of the war, it's of that war. Uh, for us, it was culture against evil, and it's another issue uh, that there is something like honor. Uh, there is a song about uh, siege of Leningrad, telling that everything can be rebuilt, never lost honor can be rebuilt. So this kind of discussion which museum is uh, promoting. Another story, vertical. We now have a lot of talk about uh, Greek and Roman art, Greek and Roman art where it must be in museums, not in the museums, in places of origin. So we tell the story, try to tell the story of how Greek and Roman art became the uh, formula, the base of our civilization. We know everybody well. Greek and Roman, all our aesthetic art comes from this. This is no, not ours, it's Cora from Acropolis. In a presentation, we also presented their real view. Yesterday, I was happy to see it on <laughs> your pictures, Max. Telling the story that what we consider now, the fantastic art and aesthetic of Greek and Roman art, is different from the real Greek and Roman art. So when you speak about the origins and what belongs to whom, you have to have this also in mind. You have to mind, have in mind these Piranesi vases, which are all built from the pieces of uh, Roman uh, antiquities and has more to do with our understanding what it should be, this white elegant art, than from the proper reality. And then we have, and we are telling another story about a story also with the Greek and Roman art. You, do, you know, if you, have, if you see there is a cross on the head. It's a story that all this Greek and Roman art was also destroyed and destroyed by the Christians, first just by the first Christians, then by iconoclasts, and then the tradition of Greek and Roman art was being destroyed by the Protestants, uh, who have seen too much uh, figuratism in Catholic art. We have to know this, we are telling about this because then we come to the modern art, and we have the modern iconoclasts, it's Palmyra, we have seen it also yesterday. You see, we are talking about the same things, <laughs> but it's important because it's very important to show this is the Palmyra, Palmyra which was destroyed, and it's an important issue uh, about your own national heritage. National heritage doesn't belong to you only, it belongs to all humanity. That's why you have no right to destroy uh, national heritage, even if it's your own, and today you don't like it. This is what is happening all over the years. This was happening also by ISIS. They, don't, they think this is a paganism, it's their own uh, <coughs> heritage, so they think why not to destroy it. So we have to promote this idea. You can't, it's forbidden, it belongs to everybody. This is the Palmyrian Tarif, which is in Hermitage, it's a fantastic text on the customs and duties in the city of Palmyra. <coughs> It was brought in the beginning of the century to Hermitage, uh, and it raises another question. 
if this and many other things have not been brought to museums of Berlin, Paris, London, St. Petersburg, they have been destroyed. Would be destroyed these days in our 21st century. You can imagine this kind of stones are a wonderful place for machine guns to shoot in and then to see how these letters, packing letters, get out. So it's another philosophical story which we <coughs> try to promote together with our collection of Middle East art which presents, uh, from our point of view, a good example of coexistence of cultures, especially in the Near East Christian culture and European culture and, and uh, Muslim culture have been coexisting. It's a beautiful dish, silver dish of the uh, 12th uh, century. It has Arabic inscriptions. It's done in a perfect uh, style of Syrian uh, crafts in the uh, 12th century. But what it has, it has double 12, double figures of saints. So it is very Christian. We even have been calling it a Nestorianian dish, but it's not Nestorian, it's a normal Orthodox Christian. Uh, so it's an example of that, and there is a theory also developed in Hermitage, that when you have uh, different cultures living together, when you take the upper classes, in upper classes, the mutual understanding is much easier. The style of, uh, style of life is the same. The same art is developed and promoted. So by collecting the things and showing them, you can show that, well, coexistence was existent even in the Middle Ages. It's time of crusades. And so it means that we do say, have some hope. Uh, like this is a, a piece, it's an Alhambra vase. It's called Fortuny vase. It comes from uh, Spain, uh, from Fortuny collection then, and then from several collections comes to Hermitage. Uh, there is also a discussion. It's, uh, Alhambra base. It has Arabic inscriptions which can be read. That's why I think it is Islamic before the uh, Malaga became uh, Christian. But it stands in Hermitage in the Department of Middle Ages, European Middle Ages, because it's, it tells you the story of uh, coexistence in Spain and Spanish culture. So we're always fighting. I'm telling well, it must be in the Islamic department. Our colleagues in European said, no, it was traditionally in European, let's stay in European. You know, being a director, I can't insist, I have to be democratic. But anyway, I'm always showing it and telling it, and it goes to different uh, exhibitions to tell this wonderful story. Well, this is another very touchy story for Russia. Uh, it's not in Hermitage, it's in Kremlin. It's the Crown of Monomach. It's the ritual crown of Russian Tsars, which was been worn in most important, uh, in most important uh, situations. And the story tells that it was a gift from Byzantium Emperor to the Tsar of Moscow as a symbol of relations, development, Christianity, and Russia being part of uh, Byzantine circle of culture. It sounds very well, but even from the 19th century, it's known that it's absolutely wrong, because well, here you see the filigrees, oriental filigrees, exactly the same ones which you have on this crown of Monomach. And certainly the work, this work was done in, by the craftsmen of the Golden Horde, this Mongolian Tatarian state, which was occupying most part of today's Russia, or by some Tatars living in Moscow. Anyway, it's very oriental. It's oriental. It is a symbol of oriental relations and oriental orientation of uh, Russian, Moscovite Russia, which then became the Russian Empire. And it's a very important issue because the stereotype of Russian history for many years well, was, it is, was that these barbaric Mongols and Tatars came to Russia and occupied Russia and were oppressing Russians. And for many years, we have been put uh, out of the European culture. And uh, well, only with strength we managed to become free. And so it was a very important thing and very terrible thing, which is called the Tatar Mongols oppression. It's uh, very serious because the second number of population in Russia today are Tatars. And it is, no, uh, it is not good. And it's absolutely not true to tell them these have been barbarians who oppressed us. And we are now, and now we are barbarians who oppress them. 
Uh, so uh, we are doing a lot in the Hermitage itself with excavations and exhibitions to tell the real story of the Golden Horde, which was a big Oriental empire on which Russia was just on the realm. Then definitely Russia, during the development of history, the Russian Tsars uh, became powerful and they conquered what was the Holden, uh, Golden Horde uh, territory. So now we have Russia is kind of hereditary to two traditions, Byzantine, right, with Christianity, and the Golden Horde, will Oriental Empire with cities, trade, and so on. Uh, and we do a lot of work just to explain some nuances of the, these uh, relations. But for instance, in Russia, there is a very wonderful legend of the uh, battle at the Kulikov field, battle of some of Russians, and not only Russians, against Tatars, and not all, only Tatars, which was the very, considered to be the most historical thing. That's when we become free of all this uh, Tatarian yoke and so on. It's right in a way, but it's not exactly right. Here's a stone which is an Hermitage, which tells it's written by officers of Timur Lang, the conquer of the rule of Samarkand, the famous Timur, uh, who was the real one who destroyed the Golden Horde. It's the text of him going to fight against Tahtamish, the Khan of uh, Golden Horde, much later than all these uh, historical events. So it was a long historical process of many uh, people involved, of many states involved. So we tried to tell it how complicated it is. And we have done, and especially our branch of Hermitage in Kazan is a place where we do this exhibition about the Golden Horde, about the nomads empires, and about all this Asiatic history of Russia. And to tell things like this is a great symbol of what really this Golden Horde was. It was a big empire connected with Egypt, Iran, and so on. This is a, um, a tombstone from Salhat in Crimea, from the excavations of the uh, uh, Golden Horde capital in Crimea on the Black Sea. It has, here you see this part of it has a lamp, which is the symbol of Islam. On another part, you have the cross, which is the symbol of Christianity. <laughs> And on it, you have Arabic inscriptions, which has nothing to do with religions, just good expression, uh, inscriptions, which all bring together different symbols of different religions, which show how uh, international this thing was. Uh, by the way, we are digging in Solkhat for many years. We have been digging there in Soviet time, in Ukrainian, in post-Soviet time, in Ukrainian time. We're digging there. Uh, archaeology and museums are bridges which try to exist always. It's, now, it doesn't happen always, but we always try to uh, exist and to keep our interrelations going on. Another story, uh, relics of the church. As I told you in the beginning, we have one of the problems of restitution. We now use well restitution for everything. Restitution, well, Russian church is, wants to get back everything that belonged to them and didn't belong to them also. Because in Russian Empire, church was a kind of ministry. So was building belonging to the church, building belonging to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to belonging to the Ministry of uh, the Court, and so on. Now, all the uh, temples, all the buildings, all the uh, economic buildings, all the icons, there is a discussion of giving this all back to uh, the church. We have discussions permanently. Today in the morning I have the next discussion of writing another letter, how to make it coexistence, because you can make it all together, you can live together, and we're giving recipes. This recipe is connected with Armenian church. It's a wonderful reliquarium uh, built in uh, Kilikia, uh, done in Kilikia, it's silver and gold. Was uh, in Europe, in European monasteries, in Kilikian monasteries, Armenian ones, European, then was in collection of Basilevsky, then came to uh, Hermitage uh, during the time of Alexander III. Uh, inside they had the relics of uh, Armenian saints, including the Grigor Lusavarich, the main saint of Armenian church. Uh, so in Hermitage, before the revolution, it was in the church of the Winter Palace. After the revolution, the reliquarium itself was shown and the relics have been taken out and put somewhere under the tables of the researchers in Hermitage just for nobody to see it. And when the time changed, uh, we took it out and we gave it solemnly to the Armenian church, uh, the relics which should be in the church. Uh, and the next step was they have done the copy of this reliquarium, which was also given to Echmeadzin. It is now used in Echmeadzin for different celebrations. Uh, the original thing, 
which is part in the masterpiece of uh, jewelry, uh, were craftsmen and part of uh, uh, history of uh, Armenia and the Middle East, is in the museum as it should be. This is one of the examples and the recipes which we present to the society. Sometimes it helps, sometimes not. Another story is conflict, vertical one, contemporary art and classical art. With all, yesterday also heard about a little bit about this. How do you divide? Do you divide museums, classical art, contemporary art? And you know perfectly know that sometimes all contemporary art becomes classical art, and so you move. It's a great, great dream of moving things from Renaissance here to Prado. It's absolutely okay. Uh, <coughs> I think that all this idea, it's a very uh, active idea that contemporary art is something different. It's very different. It must be it has, must have special museums, a special language. It'll just don't touch us and say, don't, don't touch us. Uh, it's also important in Russia, uh, but in Russia we are waiting to uh, let something like MoMA will emerge, museums for modern art. It doesn't happen. So now the uh, museums of uh, big museums in Russia begin one by one de to deal with contemporary art, to show contemporary art, to protect contemporary art. By the way, just today, well, yesterday, two days ago, I sent a letter. Yesterday was a decision of the Ministry of Culture that a big institution which was founded some years ago to promote contemporary art all inside Russia. It became now a part of the Pushkin Museum in Moscow, which is the right thing because it was, contemporary art is not very much in favor today. Uh, so it is good to make it put it under protection of a big museum, especially that these centers of contemporary art have been existing in different <coughs> regions of Russia. It's so important to keep them going. But it's always a way, how do you present it? What you see, see here, this is a sculpture of Jan Faber. <coughs> and you see the picture of Snyder's there. And Jan Faber was given space in Hermitage to do whatever he wants to make a dialogue between the Flemish collection and Hermitage and his uh, work. Definitely it was a big scandal. Uh, people have been writing in Russia, they are not writing to the newspapers or the social media, they're writing directly to the prosecutors. It's against the law, this is against the law, this is against the law. So we had to find, with the, with the help of the social media, by the way, uh, and we try, it is part of the things, we try to make this dialogue to show that there is no, there is contemporary art, but all art is one art, it's as the beginning development at the new stage, like you had it in the Met. We, Hermitage, have the depart uh, Department of Contemporary Art. Mostly we are doing the projects, just thinking what we can to collect so that it will be different from collections of other uh, museums. So this is an example of what we do with Jan Faber. And this is another thing, exhibition of Anthony Gormley. He was the curator of the exhibition. We put our classical sculptures on the floor. And another, the next room was room for Gormley's uh, sculptures. Well, this one didn't bring any scandals. Everybody enjoyed it. But these are different ways of showing what we uh, can want to uh, do, how we want to explain that it's contemporary art is part of the same. You know, uh, always with uh, contemporary art, people are telling me, well, you know, I don't understand what they're telling. I don't understand. The answer is, do you understand the classical art? Do you understand what is the meaning of Paul and Peter of El Greco? And then I explain, because I have made several television films on this, explaining what are the senses, what is the meaning of this picture and other pictures. So this kind of discussion is, I think, uh, uh, important. And we go on on this. This is part of our installation in Venice. This year, Venice uh, Biennale, the Russian pavilion of Venice Biennale was given or taken by Hermitage. And we tried to show that museum by itself can be a curator, not artists. We didn't choose any artists. We asked some artists who had a right feeling of Hermitage to do something. So it was done, it's a long uh, story. One of the artists was Alexander Sakurov, the great, one of the greatest film directors of the world who died it's an installation based on uh, Return of the Prodigal Son of uh, uh, Rembrandt, uh, where he asks sculptures to bring the figures of the Return of the Prodigal Son into sculptures. And so they took, went out 
out of the frames. I think we are all reciting. Uh, Pacheco was telling that art must get out from the frames to the people. Uh, so they came out, and uh, the story of Shakura, the question is, well, we have the prodigal son. It's a, a story about mercy, and he is, well, everything is okay. But what will happen when this prodigal son, after all the embracements of the uh, father, will stand up? What will he do? Maybe he'll ask the older son, give me one, some more money of my heritage, and whatever it will happen, because we know what happens in this land. The big, two big screens are showing that today's uh, Near East, this is the kind of a um, Bruegel's Babel uh, Tower with all fighting going on. It's 30 minutes video of the fighting going on in uh, Syria and uh, northern, of northern Iraq to show that, well, even the mercy uh, can't save the world. The world is terrible. You have blood and uh, rivers of blood going around us. So museum and contemporary art, based on the classical art, must well remind us what is, what are the things which do happen. Uh, I think it's another mission, museums trying to teach uh, people how to, uh, to, how to behave, but just to tell them that, well, even contemporary art makes, marks you think about today. Another uh, story, also vertical, it's about attribution of uh, paintings. Here we have, now we have in the year of Leonardo, so we're showing you two pictures by Leonardo in Hermitage, it's uh, Madonna Lita and Madonna Benoit. Uh, Madonna Benoit just now is in, being installed in the Museum of Perugia, where we are showing her, because it's uh, our, in Hermitage, in a way, we are doing all the things not like normal people. Uh, you know, with the year of Leonardo, everybody uh, tries to collect Leonardo. We are not, we're different. We are sending our Leonardo to Italy. Madonna Lita will go to Milano just to show how we respect and love Italian art. Uh, another, another thing is attribution, which is about the authorship, especially the Leonardo year. And that is everything that becomes Leonardo, not Leonardo, uh, makes raise a question, what is in the name? What is the name? Is the name so important? And uh, we do a practical thing. Just we showed in London, just recently restored Flora by Melzi, a beautiful uh, painting of Leonardesque. It's Francesco Melzi. Suddenly it came to Hermitage as Leonardo. 20 pictures in 19th century, everything was Leonardo. Suddenly it's not Leonardo. But it's also not Melzi because the attribution to Melzi was based on the uh, some, something like Greek inscription on this painting and another something like Greek inscription Francesco on uh, the painting in uh, uh, Berlin, I think. The restoration showed there is no inscription, not on, other paint, on our paintings, not on Berlin paintings. So no base to call it Melz and not Boltrafi or whatever. What is clear, it's a very good painting. It's much better than many other paintings. So uh, we are showing it, just reminding and showing it around, just reminding that that sometimes we have to think, what is, is art becoming better or worse as you change the name and uh, the title? And we showed it in the uh, National Gallery in London also with a group of Leonardeschi. It was quite an instructive uh, show. So this is Leonardo. Rembrandt year, this year is also Rembrandt year. We have done our Rembrandt thing in uh, Venice. And there is another story. Another story of connected with the conflicts of art of uh, today and uh, uh, history, well, is attribution as well. Our concept of authorship is quite different with the concept of authorship in the uh, times of classical art. Uh, so we have to have it in mind. And another such story is also uh, history and future, it's collectors. Great collectors are the base of all museums. Museums, all art must be finally be in museums. This is the place for the great art, from artists to dealers, collectors, and so on. Uh, and they are in the museums. The issue is, or the question is, how do you pay respect to these collectors? You can do it with having different rooms of them uh, in the museum, just like they have been in the um, 
their homes. You can do it with a museum of private collections. You can do it what how we are doing it in Hermitage. We are doing from time to time, every three, four years, are doing some exhibitions just about collectors, bringing together their collection of part of their collection and reminding everybody how, uh, what is a great collector and how important they are and how they are part of uh, what is museum life today. This, I'm showing you the first room of the exhibition of great Russian collectors, brothers, brother Morozovs. There have been Morozov and Shukin. For many years, we have been all been telling Shukin Morozov, Shukin Morozov collection, great collection of French art, great Matisse's, great Bonnard's, great Picasso's, and so on. Famous story about all those Shukin Morozov together as a result of nationalization of their collection. Only now, some years ago, we began to make separate exhibitions. There was one at Louis Vuitton of Shukin. Now this year, we opened a big exhibition on Shukin in Moscow, uh, in uh, Pushkin Museum, and a big exhibition on Brother Morozov's in Hermitage, just to show in Moscow they're telling the story of the family of Shukin. Here we tell the, just show the masterpieces uh, and the choice of these two brothers. The one was Mikhail Morozov, who was, didn't uh, last long, uh, but he was the beginning of collecting. And we have here the, he was the first who brought Gauguin and Van Gogh to Russia. And you have the Van Gogh, which he brought to Russia, which was, a, it was the beginning of a aesthetical revolution. And there is Ivan Morozov, uh, with his portrait, the portraits are by Valentin Serov. When the portrait he is sitting, uh, he has behind him the uh, still life of Matisse, the one which uh, is here on the wall. Uh, also, Ivan Morozov was, well, Shukin was collector of Matisse. The best Matisses in the world come from Shukin collection, the dance and so on. Uh, Morozov was more fond of Bonnard and his fantastic uh, collection, have fantastic pieces of Bonnard and I personally think that for the 21st century, Bonnard will be more important than Matisse, but we'll think, we'll see. This is also what we are trying to tell with this exhibition. But they're not the only collectors. Just after this, we opened, and now in Armitar, there is a collection of uh, um, Pavel Stroganov. You know the family Stroganov, the great Russian noble family, certainly mostly named uh, well famous amount of, in all the world with Beef Stroganov, but they have been great rulers of Siberia and Ural, they have been great collectors, and so many of them have been collected that in a way Stroganov, and everybody means another Stroganov or the president of Russian Academy of Arts, uh, but they have many others, and one of them was Pavel Stroganov, a uh, wonderful lover of Italian art, one of the collectors, there are not very many, who gave his collection to Hermitage, part of his collection to Hermitage, uh, Filippino Lippi and so on. The one who also his collection finally ended in Hermitage, the best uh, early Italian paintings in Hermitage come from his Pavel Stroganov collection. So it's a, another revelation for the public to remind you what, who was this person and what he has done to Hermitage. Uh, another story, this year is year of collectors. Uh, we have now a small exhibition of uh, Max Ernst, this is a small collection which, with which Max Ernst came to Paris and which was presented in Aram Manoukian's uh, let's see, um, shop atelier and was kept as a collection for many years, only recently it was first shown, I think, in Britain and then in Hermitage. The story of collector or dealer who kept the collection un intact for many, many, many years. And then in uh, three weeks, I think, we're opening another exhibition with uh, Paris uh, with the Louvre, it's about Marquis Campana. Uh, you know, the story was a great collection of Greek and Roman art, which was then sold after Marquis Campana was uh, arrested, and a big part of the collection was divided between Louvre and the Hermitage. Well, Hermitage, Louvre, as I always said Hermitage got the best, we think Louvre got the best, uh, certainly maybe the best things are in Italy still. Uh, anyway, we're going, it was shown in the Louvre now, we're showing it in Hermitage, then it goes to Italy. It's also about the story of collecting, about a story of uh, division of collections. For instance, Shukin and Morozov collection, well, Shukin collection was divided and Morozov collection was divided between Pushkin Museum and Hermitage, and it saved them from uh, being destroyed or sold because it was too modern an art. And so we're telling the story of uh, Campana collection, all these things, 
make uh, collections, allow our collections more uh, dynamic, moving from one place to another, and telling the story of dynamic with a historical dynamic with all the uh, problems and conflicts which did exist and were fate of uh, collection, we uh, still want to show all this. The whole story, art is whole story, the whole story, all the history is part of the story, bad or good, today it's bad, tomorrow it will be good, so we have to avoid this uh, wars of history, uh, historical of his wars of memory, by telling more, by discussing, and in a way, people saying, well, too much talking doesn't bring results, it does bring results. Too much talking brings uh, results, in many cases, all diplomacy is about uh, much uh, talking. And it also showed that the culture has its own uh, rights. And just uh, finishing, this is the general staff building. This big arch belongs to Hermitage. And it's also a place of fighting the historical for, for historical memory and historical wars. Also today, it was on telephone. Palace Square, big square, empty. Everybody wants to make different things on this palace square. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs partly to Hermitage, partly not. It's always fighting. We are saying that historically it's a place for military parades, for sports, and for everything which could be like a flash mob. You come, you sew, and you go out, because we have to show this. Certainly everybody wants to make stages here and to make rock concerts. And so the fighting is between us and many companies who want to make it a place, a good place where you don't play rent, pay rent, and so on, to make big concerts and big events. So sometimes we are winning, sometimes we, are, we can't win. Uh, but anyway, as a result, I think we uh, will do what we think is one of the most important things of museums today. We must well go out from the outside of our walls, not bring too many people inside our walls, to go outside. We go outside with our uh, ideas, with our understanding what is the good taste, with our understanding what the right history is, and to bring it in the streets, in the uh, squares. And this is what we are trying to do. We are calling on the first floor of the General Staff Building, we have what we call the Forum of Hermitage, where we make exhibitions which are not very artistic, maybe, exhibitions which have more social uh, meanings, uh, which bring people who don't pay for the tickets, which comes out to the uh, square, so to show that the whole life must be based on the principle on which museum lives. I have a kind of a slogan, nobody likes it, only the museum and culture people, that museums are much better than the world which surrounds them. Our economics is better, more human, our politics is better in general, while people feel nicer in the museum than outside of the museum. So this is our uh, slogan against all the hate which exists today in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.